Welcome to another episode of Rockets Talk. Your Houston Rockets are killing it right now in the NBA. I got my boy Rush with me to talk about how the Rockets have been doing and some of the discourse around the fan base that I feel like we shouldn't have to talk about. But here we are, bro. So what's been good, man? What, what, what are the Rockets, man? What's going on with our team? Are we going to make that play? Remember, I was the one that held that hope between the two of us for the play-in. Are you, are you I, I thought it was over. I really, I, and I said that I was like, "Yo, their playoff playing hopes are done." Um, that is no longer the case, man. They they're thirty two and thirty five, or are they thirty three and thirty five. Um, I think it's I think it's thirty two, thirty two wins because we just went over the uh, the over under for the season. Right. Okay. Correct. And they have a great chance uh, to beat Washington on Tuesday to go thirty three and thirty five. Right. I think they were twenty eight and thirty five at one point, and it yep. really felt like, all right, this is out of reach. Guys are hurt. Um, not going to happen. Uh, but now, no, that is, that is completely changed. They have a chance. They're going to need some luck. Um, I'm not convinced that they're going to get that luck. However, Anthony Davis scratched his cornea and he's going to be out for a while. Uh, and so the Lakers have a chance of, of melting here down the stretch. Um, so yeah, playing hopes are alive, man. I mean, look, there, there's some things I, I got to say what Ime Udoka is doing to keep these guys prepared. Mm -hmm. Next man up mentality. Doesn't matter what's what. Doesn't matter how down they get. Doesn't matter how high they get. He keeps them focused. Um, it, it's it's super cool to see, and it's very refreshing because for me, it gives me that that confidence of like, all right, it doesn't really matter what happens. I trust Ime Udoka to get things right, and that's kind of where we are. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I think you'd put a tweet out about him possibly being the coach of the year. I think if they somehow make the play in that. Given the context of the Rockets and the fact you compound the defensive efficiency of this team for the whole season, and then they make a technically like a bubble playoff team, to me that that got to be it. I mean that got, we were dead to rights as a franchise uh, coming out of the Steven Silas era. Obviously, all the money we had to pay to get these guys. Then to me, I always say hiring Udoka was the best thing we've done, regardless of whether we got hard and anybody that we could have got is Udoka because he has taken that mantle as kind of the face of the franchise and the identity. And, you know, one thing I did want to talk about with this recent uh, streak of the Rockets winning all these games, winning the last seven out of eight, and that started against the Phoenix Suns. To me, the Phoenix Suns game was a turning point for a, a lot of just things. For the team, I think specifically for Jalen Green, um, that was kind of the marker of where everything kind of switched as far as what we're seeing right now. And in that eight-game stretch, uh, the Rockets have been a pretty elite team. I think we're top five in net rating. Uh, top 10 defense we're on the fringe of being a top you know top 10 offense and um, just some things misconceptions I know people are you know obviously the discourse we'll talk about the how they're playing without Shangun but during this streak um, the Rockets have been a high-paced team and this was the emphasis we saw uh, post all-star break where they were as high as top three they've settled to about six if I'm not mistaken I think they're six right now in pace uh, for the team uh, the team is you're talking sixth in pace post All Star break. Post All Star break. Okay. Since so coach, with, with and without Shingun. Correct. So okay. this is all the games All Star. The whole, you know, what I mean, since the February whatever. Okay. If you remember, I think the last time we did a pod, they were number three. So, um, and I say that to say, uh, one thing I've seen on this streak is some people comment on the pace they're playing with, and I think people are once again mixing up pace and transition. I think we've been getting out in transition more recently because we've been getting a lot of more defensive stops. But the pace that the team is playing with, which is something that I think is helping them out tremendously, is uh, they're getting into their actions really, really fast without over dribbling. Guys are moving the ball. Um, to, and it's really started. It was emphasized to me in the uh, Spurs, the first Spurs game where Shangun got the 45 points. Because one of the comments I told to you after the game is that he looked like a Sabonis. And the reason I said that is because everything was like handoff and just kick out merchant. Like, get yep. the ball, deep, bam, pass it, shoot. Like, that was that's pace. And they were running that uh, pretty much since the All-Star break start. But to me, this streak is what I thought would have happened in January. But now I'm realizing, I wonder what you think about this. They're playing to me like they played at the start of the season, right? The threes are going in. Their, iso their isolation defense is pretty elite right now. This is what we saw in November and parts of the most part of December. And what to me happened is that they got tired. Their legs got tired because this is a unsustainable brand of basketball, in my opinion. And that January wall 
all the stuff we saw there from the entire team. And to me, it wasn't a coincidence. Everybody crashed out. To me, it was just fatigue. I, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. So I think I think that's definitely true, right? Uh, fatigue and then fatigue lump. You got to lump injuries into that, right? I think they go hand in hand. You get tired, you start breaking down. Your body starts breaking down. You start getting hurt. Then you're playing hurt, so you're tired. It's just like a cyclical thing, right? They go hand in hand. Shengun was getting a back injury, and and I think people forget that he was nursing a back injury. Um, you know, between like timeouts and stuff, he had like a huge wrap on his back, and we didn't hear anything about that from Ime or from the team or whatever. So it seems like they just kind of like he tried to play through it. Tari obviously hurt. Dylan Brooks got hurt. Jabari got hurt. Fred missed what four or five games. Um, so they were they were fatigued. They were injured as a result. Um, I think the other thing that plays into that the 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 brand of basketball being unsustainable and the reason that we're starting to see it come back a little bit. I saw Madison tweet about this on Twitter. Shout out to Madison. I think it's true. Um, the NBA has confirmed that they are loosening up how they're calling the game. Right. I think that the NBA at large, the entire league, has received a ton of criticism this season for the way that they're officiating, right? People are just tired of seeing fouls and ticky-tack, free throws and this, this and that. And the Rockets, Udoka has the Rockets leaning into like, hey, let's be physical, right? They can't call every foul. And I think we started to, excuse me, I think we started to see in January and February, they started, th those foul calls were slowing down how they were playing defense. The defense slipped a little bit. Um, the Rockets were unable to kind of keep that physicality up because the referees were legislating them out of it. Right. And now that's not that's not the case. And I saw that against Cleveland and you saw Donovan Mitchell complain about it post game against Cleveland. They were super physical on the perimeter. I mean, they were for a minute, man. It looked like late 90s, early 2000s basketball. <laughs> Personally, I love it. Like, I love it. That's what I that's my shit. Right. Um, but you have Fred Van Vliet. You have a men Thompson. It allows Jalen Green to be more physical. Like it just uh, Jabari Smith, it benefits everyone across the board. So I think those two things have a lot to do with this kind of recent stretch we're seeing, right? They got to rest, number one. And then number two, uh, they're allowed to play physical because they are undersized. And the only way that they're going to be able to continue that style of play, at least to be successful with it, is if they are allowed to be physical. It's kind of like the Utah Jazz, man, back in the day, like they would just do dirty shit and when they do it so many times, you can't call it every time, you know, and that's kind of the philosophy. Yeah. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a playoff brand and yeah. that, that style is a playoff style. Um, and it's really hard to play that brand, it's, especially it's taxing. It is incredibly taxing to guard because technically what we do and what we're doing right now, we're forcing teams to play in isolation. Yes. Like you're going to, your actions are not going to work because we're going to switch one through four on most plays and sometimes one through five, def depending on personnel. And we're going to make your guy have to beat one of our guys over and over. And in the NBA, there's a lot of good players, but there are not a lot of guys on a play and play out basis that can break down a, a, a defender, especially the, the caliber of the Amen Thompson's, the Jabari's, uh, the Fred Van Vliet's, the Dylan Brooks of the world over and over one on one. And it does wear down the offense. The only problem is your legs as a defender having to shuffle for, you know, full possession sometimes. You compound that over games and you get to the point where those threes start dropping off. Like our efficiency right now on shooting threes, it started off really bad in the past, like five games. It's, it's really up there overall in the in the seven game stretch. Um, we are up to 50. Let's see. Our true shooting is 57 uh, percent, 57.9. Nothing to write home about. But for a team that all year was 52. Like we had Jalen Green true shooting as a team uh, for the entire season. And now to be up there in the, uh, you know, high 50s in this seven game stretch, th that is really the biggest marker. You look at some of the players that we've had. Fred, I think, is shooting above 40 percent from three now. Um, Jabari is in the, if he's not above 40. I'm talking about post all star break, post all star okay, break. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, and during the streak, during the streak, he's well above 40. Jabari during the streak is above 40. Dylan is still struggling. Um uh, even Shangun was shooting 40% from three. I think Jalen was in like 33%. Uh, but the shooting is back. The defensive isolation guarding is back. Um, and I think this gives you a glimpse of what Udoka's vision of this team is. To me, the question is, how do we capture this and sustain this for an entire season? Right? So that's a tough, that's a tough question to answer, man. I mean, look, one thing I want to point out, there's so much to talk about with like the, the, the play style because there's so much nuance to it, right? And that's what happens when you have a tiny, a tiny sample of games, right? There's, they, they played three games without Shingun, so I don't really know what's what quite yet. Part of it is what you're talking about. They've been on fire. 
So yeah, so look, I mean, look, Cleveland has been struggling since the All-Star break, right? They came out the gate hot in the calendar year of 2024, and they were, I think they went on like a 16, 17 game winning streak, something crazy like that. But they're six and eight since the All-Star break. Max Struess and Evan Mobley both missed the game against the Rockets. Struess has missed the last seven games. Cleveland is three and four in those games. Mobley's missed the last six games. He's only played 38 games all season, by the way, uh, which is probably a needs to be a bigger storyline, but they're two and four with him and without him in the last six. And like I said, six and eight since the all-star break. So they've been struggling. Now, obviously the Rockets um, are without Shangun, Tari Eason, and then Tom's uh, sorry, Shangun, Tari Eason, Cam Whitmore, right? So it all evens out. But the main point is the Rockets played that level of defense without a rim protector, right? Um, everyone talks about, oh, you got to replace Shangun with a rim protector. The Rockets didn't do that. They have replaced Shangun with a men Thompson, which makes them uniquely versatile a lot of us have been talking about, man, Amen Thompson's got to start. I said, you got to start him over Jalen. This is when Shangun was healthy. Um, and Shangun's out, and they're, they're starting Amen Thompson. Now, it's funny, though, right? Because they played incredible defense last night, in part because of the physicality. They still gave up a lot of rim drives, but they were able to, to, out, to counteract that with their three-point shooting and getting out on the break. You saw multiple possessions where a traditional rim protector like Jared Allen, someone we've talked about a lot, was, was stuck out there in the post on Fred Van Vliet, and they could not take advantage of it, right? And that's one reason why the versatility of Shangun's offense to me is like, I'd rather have someone on my team that can take advantage of that, right? That doesn't, not this seven-footer that just gets taken out the game by a six-foot guy because he can't do anything with the rock. Um, but then you also look at the Washington game, and they did not play good defense against Washington. They gave up 119 points. I think their defensive rating was like 110, 111, which would be better than it is on the season. Um, but Washington scored 58 points in the paint. Uh, they shot 50% from the field. The reason that they, that, you know, the defensive rating wasn't through the roof is because Washington sucks, obviously. And because the Rockets right. were able to force turnovers <laughs> and there were a bunch of unforced um, errors, but man, Washington is six. The, the, the tallest guy they had on the court was six foot eight, Kyle Kuzma. So it's like, and then you look at the Spurs game, right? They played good defense against the Spurs. The Spurs also suck. Um, but that was not an inspiring win either, you know? So it's just interesting to me how we go, like, game to game and people get high and low. Like, people forget Jalen Green started popping off when Shengun was playing, right? The Rockets were on a winning streak when Shengun was playing. Then they played two of the worst teams in the NBA. They beat them. One of them, they barely eke it out. Um, and Jalen didn't play well in that game, by the way. 16 points on 16 shots. Two of those came from free throws in the final, like, 15 seconds because San Antonio had to foul because they were down. So it was going to be another one of those games where it's sub 33% shooting, uh, more field goal attempts than points. You know, then the last two, he goes off. Washington, he goes off. Cleveland, he goes off. So it's like everything's all over the place. And at the end of the day, for me, a lot of it just comes down to shooting. And we've had these discussions. Is Jalen shot on? The midi's been on. The three's been on. He's been finishing well at the rim. Now, like I said, Washington didn't have anyone back there, and he didn't finish well against San Antonio, but he did against Cleveland. So it's like, what do you take from these? I, I honestly, I, I have no idea what to take from all this because the sample size is so small and everything is all over the place. I'm trying to make sense of it still. I, I think the, I mean, the three game sample size is, is nasty to even, you really can't draw any conclusions from three games, especially with the, the, the type of teams we've played with two of them being two of the worst teams. And then one being a team Cleveland, even if we assume Cleveland's great, I don't care. We could have beat Denver. It's still three games. That's just one game. Um, so, but, you know, I did separate out the games to see just some things um, I wanted to touch on. In the five games, uh, when we started our, our winning streak with Alperen Shangun uh, playing against Phoenix, the second game against Phoenix where we beat them, um, and up until he got hurt in Sacramento. So I'm counting the Sacramento game in that five, uh, in that, um, in that five game stretch um, out of the seven out of the eight wins. We lost to the Clippers, obviously, but uh, the pace for the team, we were number six in pace with Shangun in that winning streak. Uh, the three games without him, guess what? We're in pace, number six, right? Pace has not ah, changed at all. Okay. Um, defensive rating with Shangun in those five games, number five in the NBA. Guess what? Our defensive rating in the three games, number five in the NBA. <laughs> um, so the only change is the offensive rating. The offensive okay. rating, uh, we went from number 14. Uh, with those five games to number seven and uh, when it went from 115 to 117. So a two points per possession difference. And the only thing that if you look at all the data that correlates with that is three point shooting. Okay. So we are shooting better uh, uh, from three, uh, especially against, uh, you know, in the past two games, 
uh, with Washington and Cleveland. That's why the three game sample size is really, really dumb. Um, in fact, it wouldn't even be fair to compare how they play without Schengen until another five games. Then you can say just for this post all-star break streak, we can make, okay, this is a small assumption, but even granted all of that, I think at the end of the day, I mean, I've seen 60 games already of what the team looks like. Um, I, I don't need any, like not, I can't take too much from this stretch right now. What I'm trying to see is, can they just keep winning these games? Because at the end of the day, the style, when we talk about the play style the Rockets have um, right now, if I ask you to say, what is their main thing right now? What would you say? There's nothing. I can't think of what are, what are they, a pick and roll team? They don't really run a, a lot of pick and rolls. Um, isolation, not really. They do a, a little guard and guard action. They do some pick and pops with Jabari. Um, they try to get different actions, a post up here with Dylan, a post up here. With, so basically, Coach Adoka is just coaching his ass off, trying to figure out a way to put together an offense. Um, with just random parts of players. And I think um, the defense is something that uh, is definitely sustainable for him. I think the five uh, switching one through five is something that they've done with certain lineups. And it is just, you know, they're playing good right now. I think it's it's been the case. And I bet you, I almost can guarantee it, if Shangun was healthy, we would have blew out the Spurs. We would have blew out uh, Washington even worse. And then the Cleveland game, uh, that would have been interesting. The yeah. one thing I will say about Cleveland, that I, I do think that him not being there did help the team um, is the fact that they can't pick on the pick and roll as much as they did. And, and that that is a thing that teams can adjust to in a long sample size. In a small sample size, if you're playing a team that likes to run pick and rolls with uh, Mitchell and Garland with Allen, they want to pick on that opposing big man. And not being able to do that because Shangun isn't there and we're switching everything, it does shock your system. Now, as if I was a, a you know a coach, if I played you in a seven game series, you might win two, because after that, there's ways to destroy teams that want to switch one through five. There are teams that are going to kill us with that style. Teams like Golden State, teams like uh, Denver, teams like Miami. The reason I say this, I saw the same movie with the uh, 2018 Rockets. If you were going to play that style, teams are going to slip on you all day long and destroy you on the backside. It is so hard to sustain that against a smart team. They will cut and slip you to death because when you start switching, especially with our young team, when you come up to switch, we switch out aggressively. They will play against that. And the screener just goes, go that screen, open layup. Oh, you want to come and help? Kick out to a three. So before everybody gets all crazy, let's just think about this as rational basketball minds. They are trying a new style against uh, teams that haven't seen it. It is working well, but if you think that for an 82-game season that you would rely on a team without an offensive identity to actually do anything, uh, I just think it's mistaken. So also, the question for me – go ahead, go ahead. Also, um, Cleveland, without Mobley and without Struess – Struess isn't big anyways, but without those two guys, they're very undersized, right? So uh, Donovan Mitchell, 6'1", 6'2". Garland, 6'1", 6'2". George Niang, 6'8", slow. You got Jared Allen, uh, and then Okoro, uh, what, Okoro, Isaac Okoro, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, something like that. They just don't have, like, if you play against a team that, that spreads you out, but that has guys that are a little bit bigger across the board, like a Miami, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, guys like that that can attack you, yeah, right? You, you're you going to be in trouble. Also, three-point shooting. They had Niang, Garland, Mitchell, um, but then after that, like, Okoro is, his percentage might be okay, but he's really limited to the corner. He's only a corner three-point shooter as far as being decent at it. Jared Allen. Um, what they had, like, I think Merrill out there, their bench is thin. Like it, it's just, it's just a tough sample size. And also when you're, when you separated the five games of Shangun to the three games without, is that the five games with the, when they went four and one and lost to the Clippers? Yes. Correct. Okay. Well, I also want to yeah. point out the opponents, right? The defensive rating Different. being the same, Correct. right? So the defensive rating was the same, or they they were ranked the same in the NBA in the five games with Shangun and the three games Great without point. in the three games without Shangun, they played. San Antonio, Washington, and then Cleveland. Cleveland's not a good offense, by the way, 17th on the season. Um, all below average. Two of those offenses, I think, are bottom five with Washington. Right. And and Washington's also the, the worst defense in the NBA, by the way, and possibly one of the worst defenses I've ever seen in my life. I'm not even kidding. Um, and, then, yeah. uh, and then Cleveland, which is 17th on offense, versus Sacramento, which is 12th on offense. The Clippers, which are fourth, fourth on offense. Phoenix, 10th on offense, despite all their struggles this season. And then San Antonio and I think Portland, who both stink. So pointing that out as well, right? Because when you normalize. And another thing to the points that you said, 
we came out the gate hot this year as a team. And then what happened? Udoka said it. Shingun said it. They were like, yo, they, they've started to adjust and, and to take Alper and Shingun out of the game, right? They started scheming specifically like, yo, this is what the Rockets do. This is how we're going to take them out of the game. It's kind of like when you get a new quarterback in there or when there's a new pitcher on the mound and you don't have all the film on him, you don't exactly know right. everything, so you don't know how to scheme. That's kind of what these Rockets are right now. They're helter-skelter, helter spread out, run and gun, hitting you from all angles. It's kind of hard to know what's what. Um, so, yeah, if there was like a full season of data, I, I would imagine things would change. And then lastly, with Jared Allen and Shangun being out, Allen was out on Jabari, and the Rockets picked on him. They put Jabari in some pick and pop, and they were able to, to take advantage of it. So schematically, that, that definitely helped, and that was good. But, yeah, it's just like all these little bits and pieces you really got to parse through before you make like a sweeping generalization. But what was the question you were going to ask? Yeah, the question is, and this is going to lead us to the Jalen Green piece, is how do we manufacture a, a, a team or produce an offense that takes – into account the strengths of your best player in Alperen Shangun and Jalen Green, who you want to be your best perimeter player. And I think we got some glimpses of it before um, Shangun got hurt. Uh, uh, but I think Jalen, this type of Jalen we're seeing, he's been like really turning it up, especially on defense. Um, since that Phoenix game, it's, he's just been a different player. The rim finishing is better. Um, and the three point shooting is starting to come around. I'm not going to I'm not sold on his three point shooting. I think it's, it's still streaky. So I don't really I, I don't really care about that. But the two point uh, uh, field goal percentage is up in the high 40s um, right now. He's averaging. Let's see. In the three games since uh, uh, that Shangun got hurt, Jalen is averaging 26 uh, points per game, seven rebounds and three assists. And to me, you know, that's incredibly impressive in the games prior to Shangun uh, being hurt. He was averaging uh, 23.6 points, uh, only 3.4, 3.8 rebounds and 3.4 assists. So he's scoring about two more points um, and his rebounds are up. Um, the three point percentage is is up definitely um, from where it was before, 32 percent in those five games. And then uh, now being up to I think it's like in damn near 40 uh, percent uh, for it now. So the three-point shooting aside, three-game stretch, he's shooting good. That's good. I think there, there are some things I'm seeing that are incredibly sustainable with how Jalen is playing, especially, one, the defense. But attacking the rim, um, I said this on a live stream we had. It seems like he's finally learning to not jump so early. Uh, from Because in the past, when he would go, one, he would expose the ball. Um, and so he was prone to getting stripped. Number two, he would jump so far out from the circle, maybe he was scared of contact that a lot of times before he got to the rim, he was already on his descent, losing juice. Now he's jumping into the bodies of defenders and absorbing the contact and finishing through. And I think that's been like a great revelation for him. Um, the dude is, I mean, he's playing, he's balling right now. And if you had this player for the entire season, I mean, we probably are outright just to maybe a top six seed uh, in the NBA, given how well our defense plays. If you in want to the talk NBA about or, in, or in the West? Uh, in the West, in the West, okay. top six in the West. If you want to talk about sample size, like I know a lot of the people that, uh, you know, I put a tweet out about people wanting to trade Shangu. Most of them are like super Jalen Green stands, right? You have a sample size of an entire season compared to a few games. Um, and some people try to pose it as they're equal. I, you know, when I said that, somebody said, well, they did the same thing. Well, no, nah, Jalen was bad for literally like 50 games, 60 games of the season. That is different than a guy being hurt for three games, right? So anybody on our team is tradable, in my opinion, like with the right price. Anybody, yeah. Shangun, Jalen, Jabari, anybody is tradable. But the price on the brick on Shangun is way different than the price on the brick for Jalen Green. So when we have these discussions, I, I want these to be nuanced. You know what I mean? I'm talking to y'all. I want it to be nuanced so you understand that it is not equivalent of what I'm seeing from these games for the whole season. So – as we evaluate things that come on, it shouldn't. your first thought shouldn't be, how do I attack the other player? It should be, how does Coach Adoka get the best out of the entire team, given the talents that we have? Um, I love that guys are playing better. I love that we have a chance uh, to make this play, and I hope we make the play. Um, and uh, all these, this, these experiences they're getting. Uh, but at the end of the day, this team we're seeing right now is not what we need to be. Right. There's three of our main core players missing and our bench still stinks, in my opinion. So yeah. to me, what can they do moving forward into the summer to help this team get better? That's the question Stone and Nima are going to have to uh, tackle. 
So do you want me to answer that or Jalen? Yeah, yeah. What What do you think? What do you think is a like you've seen this? You see, like kind of where we are with small samples with this team. Uh, you've seen the Shangun uh, piece. You saw what they look like in between post All Star break. What is your vision of this team? I mean, my vision would be if the ideal vision, right? The ideal vision would be that Jalen and Shangun have the two man game of offensive star power that we can ride into the future. That would be ideal. And then Jabari Smith is, you know, a high level three and D guy. Tari Eason does what Tari Eason does. You insert a man in there and you get all the versatility that comes with him. They took advantage of him in the dunker spot, which was really interesting. Um, Ideally, that's what you do. And then you use the Brooklyn picks to upgrade instead of having to take two of these, you know, young kids plus the Brooklyn picks to trade for whatever, Zion, Zach, Zach Levine. So, you know, ideally you avoid that and you do, you naturally build and naturally organically <laughs> uh, put it all together. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's interesting, man, because with Jalen, like, you know, when, when we compare Jalen and Shangun, I saw people calling the whole Jalen thing a narrative. Let me just be very clear, right? Um, and I know that a lot of people, for for better or worse, are going to put my name connected to Jalen just because of you know all the stuff. But let's just be clear: Jalen was playing bad, right? That was not my opinion. That just that just was what it was. Uh, by all stats and metrics, by the eye test, he was one of the worst starters at his position with his volume in the NBA. Period. Right? He he leads the team in field goal attempts now. By the way, fifteen point seven per game. It's not like he was just playing a small little role. He was taking, he's been the number two in field goal attempts all season. Now he's number one. Number two in field goal attempts all season um, with one of the worst TS percentages, one of the worst efficiency percentages among qualified players that take that many shots. Up until about a week or so ago, out of the 500, there was like, it was like some stat, 565 players in NBA history have taken 400 threes or more in a season. His percentage up until about a week or two ago was number 557 on that list, right? And that's in NBA history. That literally was on track to have one of the worst three-point volume shooting seasons of all time. I don't know where he is now. So I just want to be clear. He was not playing well, right? That's different than Shangun, who was, who had an all-star season, all-star type season. Um, that's different than in the face of Shangun having an all-star type season, someone saying like, nah, I've got to trade him, got to trade him, right? If Jalen plays like this, shit, I will completely change everything that I that I think because this is what I want to see. The issue is I just need to be convinced that it's that it's real because we've seen it. We've seen him do this right. Fool me. What's the what's the George Bush? Fool me once. Fool me twice. Shame on you. Yeah, you yeah. know, like it's just one of those things. It's like I've seen him do it before. The fan in me is really excited when he does the cool all the cool shit and the highlights and the dunks and the crossovers and hitting the threes and turning around like Steph. All that. The fan in me is excited, but then there's that part of my brain that's like, well, hold on. I don't want to jump the gun because I know he's done this before. And then and then it magically disappears over the course of the offseason. And it takes him 55 more games to, to rev the engine back up the next season. Right. Um, on one hand, there's some positive there's positive value to the fact that he's able to turn it on late in the season. But that coming at the expense of the first 40, 50 something games, that's that it remains a problem. Now, what's interesting is on the season. Um, if you look at the super advanced numbers and I'm not big on like VORP and win shares and box plus minus, cause it's still, as far as it applies to basketball, I still think it's, um, a little, you know, I'm not sure how applicable it is across the board. It's kind of a chicken and egg situation, right? Is it a player standing out or is it the situation the players in that produces those positive advanced numbers? I don't know. But, uh, that being said, he's offensive win shares on the season. He's still in the negative. He has a positive defensive win share two two point five, best of his career by far. Um, but he, but offensively, he's still in the negative on the season. And then you look at a uh, box plus minus offensive box, box plus minus. Ne- he's in the negative negative point two defensive box plus minus negative point seven box plus minus as a whole on the season. Negative point nine, which is still miles better than the previous seasons. And this is the first season he's been in the positive on VORP point six zero point six. So all of that is trending good. Um, the rebounding is actually really good. Like it looks really good functionally. Like it looks good when he does it, it makes an impact on the game. Some of the increased rebound numbers I'd have to imagine come by virtue of Shangun being off the floor and not getting the rebound numbers rebounds in the modern NBA is a weird stat. Anyways, I don't I feel like it's not what it used to be because for that reason, uh, but all that being said, the way he's playing now, right? If the three point shooting is real, let's get, let's get back to the table. I need my shooting guard to shoot three as well. And Jalen green hasn't done that in his career. Lately, he's doing it. He's doing it effortlessly. He's always been a rhythm player. And that's why 
when people talk about it, they, they, they like, they make it sound like it's this complex, nuanced, complicated thing. His whole issue has been making the shots he takes. That's it. There's other pieces and bits to it that make it a little more elevated. But, but, the, but the base analysis is, hey, he got the open shot. He got the open midi. He used his in and out and hit the elbow and rose up, but he just missed the shot. He got to the rim. He got his shit thrown. He got to the rim. He missed the layup. He's not getting to the line at the same rate as he used to, by the way. So some people have that misconception. He's just finishing better. He's shooting better, right? Against uh, Cleveland last Cleveland last night. He'd catch it and shoot it, and it went in, right? And earlier in the season, those shots were just not going in. So instead of whatever, I don't know what he finished on the on the night for shooting. I don't, I don't have his box score memorized. But those four threes that go in or whatever, earlier in the season, he was missing three of them, you know? And, and, the, and the box score would reflect that. So if he's able to keep this up, and put these types of numbers together, then I'm all in on, on whatever Jalen Green uh, can be. And part of it is they're getting in transition, which is a little bit of a red flag for me because I don't want my, my superstar shooting guard to be heavily reliant on transition. He's got to be able to attack in the half court. Um, we know he can run a pick and roll with Shingun. I've seen him make a couple advanced reads lately. He had that one, one hand whip pass to the corner like a few, excuse me, a few games ago, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. So he's doing some things, right? But at the end of the day, man, he's rising up and the shots going in. When he's rising up for a midi over these last three, four, five, six games, it is going in. When he's shooting a three, it is going in. You know what was not happening earlier this season? Both of those things. So it's like, yo, if 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 he figured the shooting out, hallelujah, let's go. Um, am I convinced that he has quite yet? No, I got I got to keep seeing it, especially against San Antonio, Washington. I want to see it in more you know tougher environments, but. But yeah, that would be, I mean, that would be my answer, man. For the offseason, if you get this version of Jalen Green and the Rockets make a legitimate play-in push or even make the play-in without Shingun, without Tari Eason, which are two huge pieces. And by the way, while we're here, if we're going to have these discussions of, oh, are they better without Shingun? Should we have the discussion of if they're better without Tari Eason? That would not make sense, right? That would be stupid, right? But Tari right. Eason's not playing and, and they're winning games. So maybe we don't need Tari Eason. Stupid life. That's facts. Yeah, That's I mean, right. to your point to your point real quick about the transition um with their starting lineup and there's a question I want to ask you real quick after I say this they are um in transition they are in the almost in the 90th percentile off of overall transition frequency with this in these three games with the starters and then transition off of steals they're number one in the NBA in that stretch and that's from uh, cleaning the glass um so a lot of their their offense is off of transition interestingly enough um, one thing I have noticed with them and with uh, with Amen Thompson basically replacing Shangun, the offense has picked up, I think, obviously, because they're like I said, we need to differentiate pace from transition. They are getting into transition more because they have really no weak links on on defense right now, especially scheme wise. You can't we haven't played a Joel Embiid or a Jokic or somebody that's going to punish us for being small. Jared, Jared Allen, for as good as he is, when you switch out on him it's not a mismatch because he can't post up. He sucks. Yep. He can't, if you get him at the three point line, he's not going to back you down and make a move. So it's really, we haven't seen one of those guys to take advantage of it. So a lot of times we're playing in isolation, forcing the teams to take bad shots and then forcing steals or going off of rebounds and we're running and hitting them with our athleticism, catching them off the def, uh the actual, the defense has been, has been worse uh, with the starters. So okay. we are at 121 points per possession on defense with Amen Thompson, Dylan Brooks, Jalen Green, Fred, and, and Jabari. So How many minutes? We, this is in 99 possessions. 89 possessions. 89 possessions are giving up 121 points per 100. Correct. Correct. Okay. So, I, you know what I mean? When you watch these games, I think, like you pointed out, the Washington game, we couldn't stop them. It was back and forth for a while. San Antonio was a low-scoring game for both of us, and then this game was just – so the three game sample size is crazy. Obviously, to the eye, we see that they're a better defense, but with that lineup, they're not right now. So that's I can't crazy. say that. Oh, that's uh, this is Udoka's defense when statistically it's been worse than what their baseline is, which is around one fifteen, one sixteen with uh with their uh, regular starting lineup. Um, but question I wanted to ask you before we end this: one thing I've noticed, as you pointed out, with Amen Thompson, they've been using him pretty much as a forward. Slash big man sometimes. You saw this this got me excited. That uh pick and roll lob that a yeah. man went and got. That was that was that was like, damn. I've been saying uh the comp with Aaron Gordon. I've thrown out Draymond Green. I've said um like 
Is it time to say bye bye to point guard of men? Because I feel like that 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 I heard Odoka even refer to him as as a wing. So, what do you think about that? Is that dream of you know a lot a lot of people want him to be like this future ball dominant? He's gonna have the rock, making all the decisions, breaking down. Is it is that gonna happen in in this regime? That is just so I have not seen that personally. I'm not right about everything, so who knows, man? But I have not, I have not seen a an every. I've told, I've said this right. He's not an every down back at point guard. Um, I think uh, Aaron Gordon is a really good comp. I think uh, Philadelphia version of Andre Iguodala with without the ability to even shoot the three whatsoever, but just like a super athletic do it all wing that can fill whatever role you need. I don't think he's a point guard. I don't think he's not a point guard. But this whole notion of oh Fred. You know, I saw I saw uh, someone like, you know, some of the bigger NBA media accounts, the ones that are like super st- stat focused, talking about oh, the Rockets shouldn't have gotten Fred. Amen Thompson needs to be playing point guard. And I'm like, man, you're not watching these games, right? He is not. His handle's OK. He does not have a point guard handle and every and every down point guard handle in the NBA. Um, and then like we've talked about, man, you put the ball in his hands. You're putting your team at a disadvantage because all the team, all the defender, all the defense has to do is back up. And I guarantee you teams are going to live with a men Thompson taking 18 shots inside the paint that are semi-contested and banking on him going nine of 18 at best. Right. Cause that's probably what would happen. Um, and then also, man, can we give some love to Fred Van Vliet? Fred Van Vliet oh, has man. been, he's been so good. He's gotten so much heat from fans over the season of like, Oh, I'm tired of Fred or oh, a man needs to be playing point guard, man. Look what happens when you use athleticism, size, and versatility off of the ball, a man as a wing, finishing plays instead of creating the plays, right? I, I mean, to me, it's like not even close. Why would you take him away from his off-ball prowess and put him on the ball, make everything harder for the offense, make everything easier for the defense? Same thing with Jalen. You know, like when I've been talking about Jalen playing off the ball, that's the idea. People think, oh, you're so athletic. Imagine when he's got the ball. No, it's easier to defend an athlete with the ball than it is to, I mean, assuming that they don't have the full elite package like like a LeBron James or some, or, or Giannis or something like that, which are very rare one-of-one type players, right? If you got one of those, yes, okay, put them on the ball. I, I still don't think a man fits that category in terms of the overall skill package because he's, he's lacking in certain skill areas. But you take a player and, and you use athleticism off the ball, like, bro, if you've ever played the game, if I got to guard an athlete, I would much rather guard that athlete with the rock in his hand then chase that dude through screens on screens on screens because it's very difficult to keep up, especially in today's NBA. You're not allowed to touch them. You're not, not allowed to like do little things to keep them, to slow them down. So yeah, I, I am off of a man as a point guard. I'm not saying it's like never, ever do it. I would just develop him as a versatile all around wing that can hit you from all angles and do all sorts of things. Right. Um, and, and again, Fred Van Vliet, he's having the most efficient season of his career. Ime Odoka has unlocked him. Um, he's having the most assists per game of his career. He has, I think the best assist percentage of his career, you know, and he's doing this, he's doing all this with his uh, usage being down. Like last year, I think he was around 23% usage this year. It's like 19%. So Fred Van Vliet is, has been the, I think the perfect, perfect signing, right? You're not going to get this defensive team switching everything, flying all over the place, pushing the pace. You don't get that with James Harden with James Harden. You get things slowed down. You get you know, hit or miss effort on defense, holes on defense. Um, and he slows things down to a grinding halt to his pace and waits for the right move. So I, I just, I continue to point that out because I've seen over the course of the season, everyone's like, oh my God, we should have gotten hardened. And then also back to the matchups, man. So we all circle Cleveland as like, yeah, I want to see how this team plays against Cleveland. Matchups are everything in the NBA. Cleveland didn't have the matchup. The Rockets blew them out the water. Cleveland didn't, didn't have the matchup. Could you imagine playing Denver without a big man? Uh, yeah. We're going to find out what this team looks like against the Thunder uh, in a couple weeks because the Thunder have a guy like Chet can actually hurt you on offense. Um, and they have Jalen Williams and SGA who have decent size, 6'5", six, 6'8", six, uh, and they can actually put the ball on the floor and hurt you. Um, so we will find out. But, yeah, I mean, you play a team like Denver who we've actually played well against and you don't have a big man, and I think some of those some of those weaknesses will begin to show themselves. So I would caution people to just wait. I mean, they're going to play the Bulls. The Bulls aren't great. And Kobe White's going to miss that game, but they're going to play Vucevic. We'll see what happens against Vucevic. Um, but yeah, matchups are everything as well. So yeah, I'm the one to get three game sample size, and uh, it's crazy we even have to um, say really that. emphasize this stuff to people um, because I just feel like there's 
I'm going to assume 99% of Rockets fans aren't idiots. Um, so to the 1% we made this podcast for, <laughs> hope you learned something. Um, but uh, to your point about Fred, post All-Star break, this is the whole, he's shooting 41% from three on 8.4 attempts. Okay. Um, I think that's a huge reason why we're doing well. Jeff Green is back to 38% from three. Jabari's 37% from three. Jalen Green is 36% from three. If, like I, like you said, if this is the shooting we're going to have, um, and this is in 12 games, this includes everybody that, you know, Cam not being hurt, LP not being hurt, this team um, is going to be really, really dangerous. And to me, the biggest factor comes down to three-point shooting um, and, and what they're doing. For uh, Amen Thompson, I, I'm with you. I think that one of the, the things that I'm seeing for him um, is not really – because if he's on ball, you do limit what you can do with the team. To me, the best case for him is to play off ball. But to me, the best compounding case for him is to play off ball with a post hub. Guys like Aaron Gordon are trash on any other team that doesn't have a Jokic, a bonus type of guy, right? Or if you're talking about Iggy being able to play on the court with Kevon Looney at the same time, you need Draymond there. Because you need a, the other non-shooter has to be just as much a gifted passer as the other non-shooter to make. Because passing is spacing, in my opinion. I view uh, good passing as spacing, cutting, all that stuff. So okay. the best way for me, like, once again, how do we get the, you know, the initial question was, what do we look for going forward is they need to figure out a way to keep doing what they're doing. I love their playing in pace. I think pace is exactly what it is. That means get into your actions fast. Once the defense um, commits, you make your moves fast, your reads fast, guys don't want to cut. I don't think it's a coincidence that Udoka said in that article we discussed before that he wanted to really start from the ground up. And then in the fact they've increased the pace over time makes sense because you can't do something fast that you're terrible at. It's going to look ugly. And that's what Steven Silas had us doing, doing stuff fast. But we were just, you know, the kids didn't know anything. So the pace being slow to me was on purpose, right? We want to yeah. learn how to do it the right way. Even though we're going to slow down, wait for the double team to come. This is like all of that stuff has led them to this point where they get to the point where as soon as the double comes, guys know where they need to go. So all of that to say, man, I'm so excited about Ime Odoka as a coach for not only this coming season, but the coming seasons, because I think what he's building here with the Rockets um, is something that in the long term, uh, they are on track to be a, a really elite team and possibly, dare I say the D word, that we might be cooking a dynasty right here in Houston. No, with this I coach. can't, go, I'm gonna throw it I out can't go there yet. Not yet. We might be cooking a dynasty. We missing some pieces, bro. I'm not, we might be cooking. We still, we don't have all the ingredients. We still, you know what I mean? I got to run to the store and grab some stuff. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I got my recipe book. You feel me? I got my main ingredients. I it's just like the Rico like, with the Texans, man, that the league's on notice. Feels like the league's on notice. It is, and and I'm just excited um, about that. But uh, so last few games, you know, we've been like I said, the competition. Actually, we have a pretty easy stretch. What do you think? Um, if how they go about the next few games, like, do you think they're going to keep being hot? Do you see I any? Think so. uh, yeah, you know, we we all have those feelings. Um, it's like that intangible. You can't really quantify it. Um, it's basketball is a rhythm game in a lot of ways, man. And sports is really momentum and rhythm, right? Baseball is like that. Football can be like that. Like, you know, when that turnover happens in a football game and you're like, oh, shit, we're going to blow this lead, you know, like you just have that feeling. And these Rockets right now have that feeling like they just feel like the confidence building. And, and by the way, when we talk about Jalen, again, we try to boil things down to like numbers and this, this and that. He's a rhythm player and he's in a rhythm right now, right? Like he's just getting to his spots, weaving in and out, pulling up, and it's going in. And you can see him; he's turning around before the yeah. ball's going in, so he feels the rhythm. And that was um, nasty, by the way, bro. Oh, yeah, he nasty. did. I, I, I'll, I'll burst the bubble. He stepped on his foot um, when he crossed him. He did step on his foot. <laughs> he did. Nah, well, but, every crossover is like a push off, but you know, you know. But um, it was, it was, it was crazy. I mean, when I was watching it, I was like, oh my god! Uh, and he turned around. He, he combined like the Harden with the Steph, right? He dropped right. him, looked at him shot it and then turned around, which is about as, I think, as disrespectful as it gets in a, in a dope way. Right. That like, is, yeah. Dope. You know, like yeah. if you ever do that, like I, I was playing, I'll, I'll plug myself. I was in a rec league and I dropped somebody. Um, I didn't do all the other stuff, but I dropped them. And it's been like years since I broke somebody, I broke them and I'd lost my mind. Like I just like looked at him and I started howling and, and he got pissed <laughs> off. And, you know what I mean? But like, it's, 
it's one of those where you're just like, oh my God, he did that. So, but, but he's in a rhythm and like when, and this team is in a rhythm, right? So that's, that's the other thing. Now being a rhythm player is not good for a star because that means, because when that rhythm's gone, it means you're gone. Right. So I need to find him to the greats manufacture the rhythm, yeah. even when they're off. Right. And I just need him, you know, to round out by getting there, but, but we'll see. Um, I also want to point out, by the way, I didn't mention this. It's just funny how short memories are, right? Out the all-star break, Jalen shot three of 14, five of 13, five of 13, six of 17, 10 of 28. It was not until that second game against Phoenix, he went 12 of 23, um, that things started turning around. Also, people forget, um, Alperin Shangun dropped 45, 15, and like six against a defensive player of the year candidate in an isolation-centric matchup. Uh, I think 12 days ago, not even two yeah. full weeks ago. It's just amazing how short memories are. It, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of agendas. Um, it's a lot of people with preconceived notions, a lot of biases. And uh, I had said this on a tweet you commented on. Uh, we are not a tanking team anymore, guys. Let's, let's, let's be serious. Let's be real. Let's talk basketball. Um, yep. And let's just root out those type of people from the fan base because I think it's, it's really disgusting. It's nasty. Yes. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I just I'm not engaging with that type of discourse. If you want to trade Shane Goon, fine, but not off a three game sample size. But that's just thank you. Thank you feel you, me? Brad. Like you can you can give me oh we need a rim. Like, okay, yeah, we can talk then. But uh, some of the discourse. But nah, man, uh, I think we can cut it there. Um, we will be back next week. This is episode number five of Rockets Talk. If you guys are new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. If you like this video, hit the like button. Let us know your thoughts on the uh, the recent sh- uh, streak for the Rockets. Uh, not only this three game, but also you know the the eight uh, seven out of eight games that they had. What have you? What are you seeing? We like to discuss with you. Obviously, you guys know we don't care. I will argue with you. Roosh is very nice on uh, <laughs> YouTube for some reason. Uh, I'm not. I'm Roosh on YouTube, and you're like <laughs> me on. <laughs> you're me on you on Twitter on, on YouTube. So I am. I am. I'm, you, Chop Shop fans know, but appreciate you, bro. Um, hey, wh- real from- quick. Big question. Do they win 40 games? They have 15 left. Yeah. They got to go eight and seven to, to finish with 40. Um, I think uh, I'm trying to think which game is going to determine that. I think they can win 40 games. Yes, I think they I'll do. I'll just tell you right games. now. Wizards, Bulls, Jazz, Blazers as their next four. They could easily go four and oh, yeah. they could. Thunder, Jazz, Mavericks. I mean, this ain't, then it's Timberwolves, Warriors, Heat, Mavericks to start April. Magic. Those are the first five. And then Jazz, Blazers, Clippers. I think they could win 40. They can win 40. They can win 40. I don't think it guarantees the plan, but I think they could win 40. Uh, and if they do, to me, successful season. Easily. Successful season. And we'll talk about what the implications are, uh, of that is when we get there. But um, you already know what it, the deal is. Keep rocking with the chop shop, and we're going to keep dropping that.